I have really high heels on. Um, it's wonderful, wonderful to be here. I noticed that I have uh, Russ Morasti uh, following me on the program, and I'm really nervous that I'll talk too long. Uh, he'll come and tackle me and take me, take me off of here. Um, great, to, great to be here, great to have the words of wisdom from the elders, to have everybody uh, coming here to address a challenge of such fundamental importance. The issue of northern justice is an incredibly complicated one. Uh, you work in one of the most difficult areas in our, in our society. And everybody here, because you work in these fields, you, you, you know the family trauma, the community trauma, the individual trauma that is associated with having to go, having to deal with the police, having to deal with the courts, having to deal with, with the prisons. And we start off in such a sad place. Um, there's, there's not much joy. Uh, when we're successful, at the end of a long process, people come out of the system healed. Uh, when we're successful, they, they're saved. When they're successful, a life, a life is taken from a trajectory of hardship and, de and desperation and given instead some hope. Um, but we don't always succeed. Uh, we don't always succeed. Uh, a lot of people get into the system and don't come out healthy. Uh, they don't come out healed. Uh, we don't, aren't able to deal with the family trauma and what have you. So there is a sense of hopelessness that, that sort of pervades a lot of our conversations. And that actually makes me just so much more impressed uh, with all of you, uh, with the work that you do and the dedication that you show and the, the fortitude that you demonstrate on a daily basis is how you sort of try to cope with something that has, has so little foundational joy. Um, the justice process starts with, with sorrow, and it starts with hardship. Um, I'm at, in 1974, I, went, uh, I graduated from high school, but I went to high school in 1968 or 69. 30% of my first year class, uh, my, high, my grade eight class were Aboriginal students all, from all around the Yukon. There's only one real high school in the Yukon and they came in from all sorts of different places. Um, when I graduated in grade 12, 30% um, of the students in grade eight, one student out of 110 in grade nine. The dropout rate in Whitehorse, and Whitehorse is a very prosperous, very stable, successful community. One Aboriginal student graduated in 1974, when 30% of the students, several hundred, who went in in grade eight had started. And we know that educational success is rooted in family. We know that it's rooted in safety of community. We know that it's rooted in well-being. Um, and so what we were actually seeing was the failure, not of students, but of Canadian society. And we have this really interesting process. I know we don't use this language anymore, and I'm glad we don't, because it's quite horrible. But for a long time, we used to always talk about the Indian problem. Um, and the idea was that Aboriginal people somehow had something in their roots, something in their character, in their personality that, that created problems for their adaptation. And one of the things we've realized, and is realizing it very, very slowly, is that we actually really have a problem in Canada, but it's actually a non-Aboriginal problem. It isn't an, ab an, ab an Indigenous problem. Um, something has happened, and what happened to Indigenous communities, particularly in the North, is actually non-Indigenous people. How did we get here? Because there's a couple of, I think, important, important uh, elements to this. Number one, just to start off in an odd sort of way, realize that when Northern people ac accelerate and accentuate every significant sort of challenge in our society, they have a justice issue problem. We'll talk about that as we go along. But the challenge is if you're living in Saskatoon or Regina or Swift Current, you have challenges, but the courts are actually right there in town. Sometimes the prisons are right there in town. Sometimes the services are right there in town. And when you're up north, you have to leave. The people are drawn down to courts in the south. They're put in prisons in the south. They're dealing with healing people from the south. They don't get their family talking to them. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you something, my son's in jail. Um, my son was living in, in Regina and um, um, is serving five and a half years. He's 20 years old. Um, no 20 year old should be serving five and a half years. And he's right now in Grand Cache prison in northern, northern Alberta. And what's really interesting, we were up there, my wife and I go up every week, uh, to every month to visit him. It's a five and a half hour drive from Edmonton. They put it as far away as they possibly could. Um, and what's really interesting is it turns out that Marlon's a bit of a superstar in prison. Uh, so why? He says, well, because you're the only ones whose parents come all the time. And the fact that we show up and talk to him, he phones us two or three times a day um, because we can afford to pay his phone bill and most of his friends can't. Um, and you just realize that's a fundamental sort of foundational problem and when things are happening in the north, 
you know, there's a number that came out today. Three quarters of all the Aboriginal people living in northern Saskatchewan are poor. Three quarters of all the Aboriginal people living in northern Manitoba are poor, right? When you have the, the inability to sort of deal with the financial challenges, so many things follow, follow from there in northern Saskatchewan and more broadly. Number one, we have a real problem with basic justice. Basic justice has nothing to do with police, nothing to do with courts, nothing to do with prisons. Basic justice is whether your society actually deals fairly and equitably with everyone. That is when we talk about a just society and talking about providing social justice, we have social opportunities, economic opportunities, cultural equality, social and political equality. What we have instead in northern Saskatchewan, northern Saskatchewan is the second poorest part of Canada in terms of per capita incomes. We have marginalized people and we have huge disadvantages. You know them, you live with them all, all, all the time. And I remember when, when the terrible tragedy happened at Lalash, talking to some leaders from other communities, and you probably heard these conversations, maybe you had these conversations and said things. This is, why does it take something like that for anybody to pay attention? Because all of you know darn well that you could have picked any month in the last 15 years and come up with enough reasons for the world to pay attention to what's going on in your communities in northern Saskatchewan. But telescope all those events into one day and all of a sudden it becomes something that attracts massive international attention. So you have basic justice problems. We have a huge problem with basic justice in Canada. And then we have the formal justice issues, and that's what you're all going to talk about. And I'm not going to talk about that one because you're going to spend the next three days engaged in a conversation about what, you can, what you're already doing well, what you can do better, and what you can't figure out at all yet. I think what I want to sort of suggest to you is that we should actually look at context and try to understand a little bit more about how we got to where we are today. And I think it's very important to realize, because I think, I hope at the end of my, my, my short talk, that you'll realize that the strength you need, uh, Dwayne's become a good friend in our conversations over the last while, and the wonderful story he told, I was a bit nervous to be honest, because whenever he tells stories, they usually have a punchline that's actually not so nice and usually aimed at me. And so I was kind of glad that he sort of ended up with such a wonderful, powerful story, because his message was, I think I'm right in saying this, Dwayne, that the power is in here. Interesting things. If you go up as late as the 1950s and early 1960s, Aboriginal people had encounters with the prisons. And it was interesting what the Vice Chief was talking about when he was talking about the importance of alcohol and the overconsumption of alcohol. Um, there was no overconsumption of alcohol problem in northern Saskatchewan until the 1960s. This is not an historical problem. It is not something that is rooted in indigenous culture, really a so solid, long piece of the history of the place. It actually is a function of my lifetime. The my lifetime. <coughs> Almost all the encounters with police, when you look at the period before 1960, focused on an absurdity. The Indian Act made it illegal for an Aboriginal person or an Indian person to actually possess alcohol. You could have two people walking down the street, one Aboriginal, one non-Aboriginal. You could each be holding a bottle of beer. You're actually not supposed to consume it in public, so I've already broken the law. So you're walking down the street, police officer comes along and says, oh my, you white person, go home. Don't drink in public. Put your beer back in your pocket, go home. Aboriginal person, doing exactly the same thing, come with me, you're going to jail. In many northern jurisdictions across the country, 95% of all the Aboriginal convictions before the 1950s were for possession of alcohol. Now what's the significance of that? Well, the main significance of that, I think, is that it actually discredited the policing and legal system. It showed indigenous people from the outset that the legal system was actually based on racial discrimination. It was based on treating people very, very differently and stopping Aboriginal people from doing exactly the same thing non-Aboriginal people did. And if you're an Aboriginal person in this context, you're gonna look at this and say, I'm sitting here in jail, and they gave me two weeks or three weeks, it's not a big penalty in one sense. I'm sitting here in jail for doing something that non-Aboriginal people can do whenever they want. And so what, what's the message you take away from the policing system is that the policing system is just kind of dumb. Think about what the justice system is rooted on. The justice system is rooted on the idea that we're essentially terribly embarrassed and scared to actually do something wrong. You know, you, know, you want your mother and father to hear about what you've just done. We actually use social control. We help people what they're not supposed to do, how they're not supposed to behave. And that's supposed to be internalized that. 
So if you have a system that basically is founded on shaming, and it works really well, by the way, that's not a criticism of the system. We basically tell people what we value and what we don't value, what we, what we will tolerate and what we will not tolerate. That's, that's the whole basis of the justice system. So we basically use the justice system to communicate community standards. And if your community standard is indigenous people, by definition and by the simple fact of their existence, are different than and lesser than non-Aboriginal people, the justice system has conveyed a really horrible message in its very first instance. In those environments, it's very hard to feel anything but angry at the system. It's fundamentally unjust. We're not talking about the police today or the courts today or the prisons today. We're talking about the 1950s when people's attitudes toward what the justice system represented. So what happens then is the justice system for a long time has been a foreign import imposed on indigenous people, not created with indigenous people, not managed by indigenous people, not even necessarily reflecting indigenous values. A lot of the values are the same, don't murder somebody, don't beat somebody up, don't steal things from them, but other elements were simply, simply not. But there's also something else I want to sort of emphasize, and again, the Vice Chief talked about this and Duane as well. We have this tendency in Canada to make it sound as though the social problems of today are rooted in the distant past that the problems are back in the 19th century, or back in the fur trade, or back in the residential schools, and people are always talking about residential schools, which had a huge and negative impact, and many of you in your room, but the kids I went to high school with in grade eight were the last group to go through elementary school and residential schools in the Yukon. So when I look at people here, there's a couple of you who are my age and a little bit older, you know, you're, that's that, your age group, went to residential schools. <clears throat> but they were started in the 1880s. And so when we talk about it, we talk about this long-standing tradition. In northern areas of the country, most indigenous peoples did not go to residential school until the 1950s. They weren't actually compelled to go until the 1950s. And so we tend to sort of look and say, the problems started way back then, way back when it wasn't my father, it wasn't my grandfather, it wasn't a great-grandfather, John A. MacDonald and all that kind of stuff. What I would suggest to you instead, and this hopefully helps explain a lot of the intense challenges we're facing in northern Saskatchewan, is that the intense changes, the real traumatic transformation of northern Saskatchewan happened in the 1960s. So in the 1950s, Canada became embarrassed by the social and economic condition of indigenous peoples and decided it had an obligation to get involved. And we got this huge flurry of government paternalism. We as the government know what's best for you. We don't think you should be wandering around hunting and fishing and trapping. That's not how modern people live. We don't actually think uh, that you should sort of still live in tents. We think you'd be much better off in a government house on a reserve. And we think we can pick the places that are best for you. Sometimes they pick places that were central to indigenous peoples, but other times they just found places that were good, convenient. So reserves come into real effect. Southern houses come into real uh, public use. A search for standard Canadian jobs takes over. In the 1950s, we also saw, just think of how these things are piling up, the collapse of the commercial fur trade. Um, this is one of the many curses of polyester. Uh, but polyester clothes came along and just sort of undermined the sort of luxury market for furs. And the prices for furs actually dropped by, thir by three quarters between 1947 and 1952. And so people who had a good lay of living based on the fur trade, they, they made enough money to get into the fur trade to keep themselves comfortable for the rest of the year, all of a sudden have lost three quarters of their income. And the income from the fur trade drops at exactly the same time that the government's money started to come in. We get social welfare programs brought into the North, um, lots of social change, major changes in roles and responsibilities, the role of men changes, the role of women changes, the role of parents change, the independence of women separate from looking after family in traditional ways. In the same time period, we get a rapid expansion of economic development and resource development all across northern Saskatchewan and across northern Canada as a whole. In that period, the period from 1950 to 1970, we actually occupied more indigenous territory worldwide than at any 20-year period in world history. The issue itself, as far as I'm concerned, is actually not change by itself. Aboriginal people have adjusted to change for a long time whether it was the importation of European diseases, the arrival of the fur trade, new technologies. Aboriginal folks have adjusted all really well over hundreds of years. What made this time different, the 60s and 70s and 50s, 60s and 70s, was that Aboriginal people had almost no control over that change. The change was happening to them, the change was not directed by them.
It's wrong, I think, for example, to assume that Aboriginal people, Métis and First Nations people are opposed to development. We have tons of good examples, and Northern Saskatchewan is one of the best, of Indigenous communities working with resource companies to find common cause and to create a common future. What Indigenous people have been opposed to is rapid imposed change, where they do not have the ability to control what actually happens. So I think, and this is one of the great topics we're not really supposed to talk about in Canada, and, and we do, you know, Canada's a wonderful country. I think it's one of the greatest countries the history has ever seen. We are a remarkable, multicultural nation where we're friendly and kind and helpful and a whole bunch of things. But until we start talking really openly about the simple truth of Canadian reality, or the simple truth of Canada's relationship with Indigenous people, is that we are fundamentally a racist nation. We deal with Indigenous people based on racial assumptions. We deal with them based on racial categories. We deal with you based on how non-Indigenous people see you, expect to see you, and understand you. But I also want to pick up on something else that I think is really important. Indigenous people in northern Saskatchewan have had hundreds of years of continuous economic engagement. The whole question of whether Aboriginal people want to participate in the economy was set to rest in the 18th century, and the 19th century, and the 20th century. Aboriginal people worked. They worked and they worked hard. They worked hard in the fur trade. They worked hard in commercial fishing. They worked in logging. They worked in the mining act activities. They built roads. Aboriginal people have worked and they've worked and they've worked. They were competitive. They were hardworking. And they were very reliable. What I've tried to suggest is that the world was turned upside down in the 1950s and 1960s. That combination, the fur trade, government intervention, resource development, marginalization, Decisions being made without Aboriginal input and without Northern control changed the very way that they saw their lives and experienced themselves. There's some really good news in here, by the way, and that is that the pride of the 50, 60, 70, 100 years ago is still in these communities. The determination to be part of shaping their own future is still in these communities. This is not in any way a lost cause. So a couple of things. Nobody here in this room is gonna come up with a perfect solution today, tomorrow, or the next day. There are no quick solutions to problems that are as complicated as this. There's no simple answers. To a degree that we don't recognize the northern communities are proud, you recognize it, you live there, independent-minded, culturally strong, far stronger than people actually generally think. You are, however, these communities torn by external interventions, and there's still lots of them. I was up in the Yukon a couple of weeks ago and talking to some Aboriginal friends, and, and they're getting kind of mad about the environmentalists. Because they say, we'll decide what's environmentally safe and sound. We don't want people from Vancouver telling us what we can and can't do. We want to be in control of our, of our own futures. And think of what the countermeasures, and I always marvel at this. This is where being almost 40 sort of reminds you of how fast things change. As late as the 1970s, Aboriginal people had almost no regal rights. Only in the mid-1960s did we recognize the Aboriginal right to hunt for food. Only in the mid-1970s did we recognize the Aboriginal right to fish for, for non-commercial purposes, for food and ceremonial purposes. Only in 1982 did we recognize Aboriginal and treaty rights in the Canadian Constitution. Just bit by then, before, we still have the Indian Act telling Aboriginal people what they can't do and telling the government of Canada that it can tell Aboriginal people what to do. But think of what's happened since then. Year after year, court victory after court victory. Duty to consult and accommodate on resource projects. I can tell you, guarantee you, in the 1970s, nobody thought that kind of stuff would come down. We're getting greater political attention. The last federal election in Canada was the first time that Aboriginal policy was a major issue in the election campaign in a positive way. The Liberals and the NDP were both very public about talking about major changes. So we are making improvements in these relationships. We are fighting for every inch as you go along. So, I'm not a fan of small tinkering. I think you will have to do that as you go along, making the best of your resources. But we need to make real change. We need to make foundational shifts. And we can see it happening. A government, a prime minister talking about nation-to-nation -nation relationships, that's new. The empowerment of Métis people through the Daniels decision, that's huge. The UNDRIP, United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, Canada has signed on, saying we will create dignity for Indigenous communities in the years to come. Aboriginal engagement in resource development, and on and on. So I guess I would just encourage you, just by winding up, that you, know, you must focus on the processes and structures of, the, of, of formal justice. 
Make the, the policing system, make the court system, make the, the prison system, make the rehabilitation systems work as best you can. We are talking about lives that are being lived right today. But in the process of doing that, let's focus our broader energies on basic justice. Let's try to create a more just, more fair, more equitable society here in northern Saskatchewan. Not pointing fingers at anybody. These are broad historical processes. But right now, northern Saskatchewan is actually a, a venue of huge injustice and of huge inequalities. It is also one of the most interesting places in Canada in terms of cultural partnerships of corporations, government agencies, working with indigenous communities, working with municipalities, working with uh, First Nations and what have you. So it's gonna be a hard struggle. It is hard to overcome a history. It's important to realize that history is not uh, 300 years long. Most of the historical relationships between indigenous peoples, northern peoples, and the rest of, this, of the world have actually been really positive. We got along well. We collaborated, we were partners in business development and what have you. I think there is unprecedented challenges and opportunities for change and improvement. But it's important that we actually step back for, as governments. It's important that non-Aboriginal people from outside the North step back. Not because we despair, not because we've given up, but because we have real respect for the people of Northern Saskatchewan and your ability to control your own future. We will learn to respect your history and culture we will make a commitment to listen, we will make a commitment to learn, and we will watch, I think, a major improvement in basic justice over the next 15 to 20 to 30 years as Saskatchewan and Canada finally find a proper and appropriate long-term place for Aboriginal people and for Northern Saskatchewan. Thank you very much.